All right, we're, we're in John chapter 3 tonight for our New Testament study, but before we go to John chapter 3, I want you to, if you already got your Bible open to John 3, good, mark it, hold your place or something there, and flip back to Numbers because it's important before we read John 3 to read seven or eight verses here from uh, Numbers chapter 21 because Jesus is going to expound on Numbers 21 beginning with verse 4. And following, I'll give you just a minute if you want to to find Numbers 21. That's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. What is that? Fourth book of the Bible. Fourth book of Moses in the Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, chapter 21. About the fiery serpents, which is a King James Version of saying the venomous snakes. I used to watch that show that came on Nat Geo or something. I watched every one of them for a while there about them snake handling preachers. And uh, there's one from up here at La Follette and there's some from Kentucky and all. And, uh, and this kind of interesting. But uh, that's where I learned uh, That's where I learned that. I was telling somebody about it here a while back, the difference in a serpent and a snake. According to them snake handling preachers, a serpent is the only the poison ones. <laughs> but... I don't know, according to the King James here, it's a fiery serpent, which means a poisonous snake or a venomous snake. So Numbers 21, verse 4, traveling with Israel here across the wilderness in their 40 years journey. It says, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, or go around Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. It was hard, and they had left Egypt, and so now what happens when it gets hard? It wasn't a cakewalk across the desert, so it gets tough on them. So what did they say? Numbers 21.5. The people spake against God and against Moses. They complained, and they said, uh, the, I like the King James version of, for complaining. They call it murmuring. Murmuring. They murmured. They complained against God. They spake against God and against Moses. And they said, Numbers 21, 5 in the middle, Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? <laughs> for there's no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loathes this light bread. Now that'd be the miraculous manna that God sent them. And, and uh, I don't think the Lord liked this because verse 6 says, And the Lord sent, see that, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. <laughs> and they bit the people. There's two people lost on Ball River Trail uh, Monday uh, for two days and one night. And somebody told me they, the, they sent some of the rescue crew uh, in from Basin Gap to come out Miller's uh, Cemetery up there in the middle of the night and said one guy come out and said he had never seen so many snakes. He said, what's through that old old trail there? So that's what Israel was saying, said they was biting them, the fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Much people of Israel died. These were God's people getting chastised by the Lord for their complaining and sinning against God. Verse 7, therefore the people, they came to Moses. Now God sent judgment. That's the bottom line, right? They've sinned. God sends judgment. That's the way it is because that's what it takes to bring people back in line, put them back right with God again. So the, the Lord, they, they, the people realized that, hey, they were getting punished by God and we're, what are we going to do? And they said, well, we better go see Moses. And the people came to Moses and they said, they confessed to him, said, we've sinned. Verse 7, for we've spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray to the Lord that he take away these serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. He acted on behalf of the people as an intercessor to God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Now here's the cure, and a very interesting cure. The Lord said, make, thee a fire, make one of them fiery serpents, make one of them venomous snakes, and set it up on a pole. And it'll come to pass that everyone that's bitten, when he looks upon it, will live. So Moses, he goes out there and he makes him a mold and he takes some brass and he makes one of them, it looks like one of them snakes, and he puts it upon a big stick and sticks it. And Moses made a serpent of brass and he put it upon a pole. And it came to pass, if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, 
He lived. Now in that is what? They had to believe God. Moses said, here's what God said we're going to do. If you get snake bit, you've you got to have faith enough to do this. Faith brings action, right? You go over here and you, you look at that snake on the pole and God said you'll be healed. So that's the background for John chapter 3 over here when we get to the middle of it here in a minute. A lot of people don't even know this and they read John and they, they don't know that Jesus is talking about this. So we're going to John 3. Starts out, we're going to meet Nicodemus for the first time in John. We're going to run into him three times before this book's over. But the first time we meet him, he's a, he's a, a teacher in Israel, a rabbi himself. We're going to find three rabbis in this chapter tonight too. John the Baptist is called a rabbi, and Jesus is called a rabbi, and Nicodemus is called a rabbi. Um, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, or rabbi. The same came to Jesus by night. Just to point out as we breeze through, John is a, is a writer who plays with light and darkness. Jesus was the light of the world, but the world loved darkness. Darkness is evil, light's good throughout the book of John. Jesus went out on the night of his betrayal and it was night. We see that over and over again. Nicodemus comes by night to see Jesus. Uh, why did he come by night? Well, he's walking in darkness, but he also, I mean, very literal, practical reasons too. He, he was afraid of his peers. He wanted to go talk to Jesus, but he didn't want to be seen probably. So the same came to Jesus by night and, and said unto Jesus, Rabbi, we got two rabbis talking now. We know, but of course Jesus is much more than a rabbi. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles. Now, see, that's the thing uh, that even the enemies, you find out in, in, the, in the Bible and in Josephus and the ones outside the Bible, that the enemies couldn't even deny the miracles that he was doing. They hated him. They wanted to kill him. But nobody ever said that he was making this stuff up. So uh, the Nicodemus says, nobody could do these miracles that you do us except God be with him. Now, what do we know about Nicodemus already? We know, well, Nicodemus was a very religious man who led a synagogue. He's a rabbi. And Nicodemus, like the Jews of that day, were, uh, they, were, they believed in the Messiah, but they were looking for the Messiah. But Nicodemus hadn't come to the point yet that he realized that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been praying and looking for. So he's beginning to wonder about that, I think, because of the miracles. And he wants to come and talk to Jesus. You can't blame him for that. And uh, Jesus answered, verse 3, and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this was spoken to Nicodemus to start with, and it, it's sort of like uh, Nicodemus wants to ask uh, theological questions, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, said, the first thing you need to be is to be born again. Because that's the primary thing. Because uh, you'll never see the kingdom of God in heaven or you'll never see into the kingdom of God in these theological things unless you be born from above, born again. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How? Now this is almost funny. I mean, Nicodemus was serious, but it, it shows a, a problem of... Uh, Understanding not only the words of Jesus, but the Bible that we still have sometimes is, uh, is, is Nicodemus just heard this in a very literal sense. You, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus, how? I'm an old man. Can I enter into my mama's womb a second time and be born? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and, and be born? Now, we know right off the bat, right? We know, Nicodemus, you're taking that too literal. Jesus is speaking spiritual. But you're only hearing literal. And, and I said that's still a problem today when we study our Bible. You know, I, sometimes, I, you know, I, I'm like, is this spiritual or is this literal? Like, especially with the things to do with the end times. You know, is that temple literally going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem like the prophets of old say? Or is that a spiritual way of saying that everybody that mistakes the Antichrist for the real Christ puts him on the throne and know you not that your bodies is the temple of God? And maybe that's the only temple. I, I don't know. I know that there's not a temple for us anymore in Jerusalem because we don't need one because know you not that your bodies are the temple of God. The Lord sits on the throne of your heart. So, you know, it, it's still a, a thing that we struggle with. What's spiritual, what's literal? But through the book of John, 
you will find a common theme that Jesus would go and speak spiritual things and people would just take them very literally. We've already seen that. Jesus said, uh, talking, John said it in the last chapter, wasn't it, that he's speaking about his death when he said, if, uh, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it back again. And even that, that's, that's the beginning of the book of John, but when we get to the end, there's still it's one of the charges that they t put him on trial for. He said he would destroy the temple and build it. He said that and they laughed at him because they thought, how's he going to build that big temple back in three days? But John said that he spoke of his death of what he's talking about, his, this temple. So Nicodemus doing the same thing. He's taking it 100% literal, and Jesus is talking 100% spiritual here. If you be born again, it's 100% spiritual, right? It's not something of the flesh. So Jesus answered and tried to explain it to him. Verse 5 said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's the fleshly birth. I'm going to, sorry, that you're... The water breaks, the baby's born. <laughs> Except a man be born of the water. Everybody here, every, everybody here and everybody in that's living in the world today, they were born that birth, right? If you're in the world, you were born a physical birth. But uh, the second birth is what counts with God. And of the Spirit. Be, God be born of water and of the Spirit. Except that second one's there too. He cannot, very strong word, cannot enter the, into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, and you can draw a line from flesh to water, to, he's explaining that, is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the spiritual birth. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must, and there's that strong word again, you must be born again. And then Jesus does what preachers have always done. He tries to illustrate the truth that he's just spoken with a picture. Something that you can illustrate with. The window, uh, illustrations are like windows into the, the shed light on what you said. So Jesus uses something that everybody knows about, the wind. He said the wind, now it blows where it, wherever it wants to, where it listeth. And you hear the sound thereof. We was in here men going, we could hear the wind blowing and the rain hitting on the roof and the thunder rumbling. And, and we can could, we could hear the wind, but, but you can't tell where it comes and where it goes. And he said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So he compared and contrasted the literal wind with the Spirit of God. And it's just like this. You can't see the wind. It's invisible. But what we see is the effects of the wind. And people that are, are Christians, they're born of the Spirit of God. You can't see that in them. But you can see the effects that it has on their lives. And Nicodemus answered and said unto them, Second time he used this word, how? How can these things be? <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto them, Art thou a master or a teacher or a rabbi of Israel? And, and you don't know these things? Because Jesus is making a point, not just for Nicodemus, but for all of us that have read this ever since. That you need to learn this before you learn anything else. But you've got to be born again because that's the most basic thing. <laughs> You don't know these things? It's verily, verily, I say unto thee, verse 11, we speak that we do know. We talk about what we do, and we testify that what we have seen. If you go to a court of law and you can't testify on conjecture, well, I think or I feel, you can only testify about what you've seen, and, and, and you still don't receive our witness. If I've told you earthly king, earthly things, and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you the heavenly things? You're not ready for the spiritual things yet, Nicodemus. You haven't got there yet. But, and, but Jesus goes on and says, now, now no man's ascended or gone up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. And Nicodemus was talking to him, but he hadn't got a handle on it yet. Even the Son of Man, Jesus used the Old Testament term for the Messiah, that Nicodemus would have been familiar with, beginning with Daniel and following with other prophets, the Son of Man. And Jesus applied that messianic term to himself, which is in heaven. And then's why we started that with Numbers 21. Because Jesus is going to illustrate the gospel using that story about them snakes back in Moses' day. He says, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, we have the, 
the benefit of hindsight and we know that Jesus was already talking about the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, think about the parallels of this. The people were snake bit. And God says, well, you're going to die. <laughs> Unless I mercifully provide a way of escape. Moses, here's what you do. You, you make your mold and make one of them brass snakes and put it on a big stick and hold it up where it'll be up high. And if people will believe the Word of God, if you didn't believe, you wouldn't go do this, right? So somebody got bit by a snake and said, Oh, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And, the, and the, one of their buddies says, No, uh, I've, I heard that somebody else got bit the other day. They've got a cure now. All you got to do is go over the hill and see Moses. He's got this big brass snake on a pole. And if you look on that, you're healed. Now, if you said, well, that's stupid and ridiculous. I ain't going to do that. You'd die. <laughs> but if you believed God, you'd go do it. And if you went and did it, you would live. You'd have life. <coughs> Now, Jesus took that snake and said, that snake represented me. Now, everywhere else I think in the Bible, a snake represents what? Sin and the devil. It started in the Garden of Eden, the serpent, right? <clears throat> this is the only time in the Bible that a snake actually represented Jesus. And the reason that is is because the snake represented Jesus when he was hanging on the cross covered with our sins. And everybody that's ever been born, or is, we've got the juice of the serpent running through us. We're fallen creatures who are prone to sin. We're snake bitten by the old devil himself right in the flesh. But God says, but there's a cure for that. If you look at the one <coughs> who was suspended between the heavens and the earth, you'll live eternally. Let's let Jesus preach this here. <clears throat> My, verse 14, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must Jesus the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever, that's anybody, right? Whosoever believes in Him would not perish, just like Israel and the snake. Whoever believed the Word of God and did it, well, they wouldn't perish. But in, it, it, everything that happened in the Old Testament was like little literal microcosmic things that were illustrating the truths that were going to be spiritual in, in our age, the New Testament age. Whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 5, uh, 16. Y'all know John 3.16. But we have John 3.16 because it's really connected to John 3.14 and 15, which is connected to Numbers 21. For, and the reason God did this, that he provided a cure for our snake bitterness. <laughs> he was motivated by love. For God so loved the world, and his, that kind of motivational love of God resulted in God doing something he gave. You love somebody, you want to give stuff to them, Right? God gave an unspeakable gift of His Son to us. He loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We're all children of God, Christians, but Jesus is the unique Son of God in that relationship. That whosoever, anybody does what? Believes in Him. Should not perish, because we're snake-bitten sinners, but will have everlasting life. John 3, 16 is connected with this big story, isn't it, that illustrates the gospel. John 3, 16 is sometimes called the gospel in a nutshell. We have a righteousness which is by faith. We know that we're snake-bitten sinners, and we believe that Christ is the cure. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Now, the world don't get that today. People still think that Jesus has come to condemn us. No, there's the answer to that. Every human being in the world is already condemned. We're all born sinners and we all sin and we're all condemned to hell. But God in his mercy provided a cure that we don't have to go to hell. We don't have to die spiritually. 
He that believes on him is not condemned, but he, all you got to do to be condemned is just don't believe. <laughs> You're already condemned. He that believes not is condemned already. They're already under the judgment of God because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, which is the only hope for humanity, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said this, he continues on in his red letter, if you've got a red letter edition here, and this is the condemnation. This is, that, this is the judgment. And here's what it's all about, and it's still about today. That light has come into the world. The light of the world came in Jesus Christ. But why did men reject Him then and why do men reject Him today? Because they love darkness more than they light because their deeds will evil. That's just a different way of saying because they, ch they love their sins more than they love Jesus and they chose sin over choosing salvation. For everyone that does evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light, lest his deeds would be reproved. But he that does truth, as opposed to evil, or follows the truth of Jesus, comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest or revealed, that, they, that they're wrought in God. Now you take those last two verses and it just says right here, the life you live reflects what you think of God. If you're living a sinful life, it says, hey, you hate God. If you're living a, a life of a Christian, it says, hey, he's, he's trying to reflect glory to God. They're revealed. And it points not to us, but to Him, that God did this. <laughs> They're wrought of God. Our deeds either point to God or they point to Satan, right? Light and darkness. Verse 22. We join up with John the Baptist again. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he, Jesus, he tarried with them and baptized his disciples. I think we find out from the other gospels who he baptized here. And John was also baptizing in and on near Salem because there was much water there. And they came and they were baptized. And for John was not yet cast into prison. That's a glimpse of what we're going to read about later on. We didn't know that yet. Just reading John. <clears throat> then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying or baptisms. <clears throat> Ceremonially purifications. Baptisms are purification ceremonies. <clears throat> and they came to John. And they said unto him, here's the third rabbi we meet in this chapter. Rabbi, John the Baptist, he that was with you beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. So some of these folks are coming to John the Baptist, and they said, you've got you baptizing here, you've got Jesus baptizing there. It says, looks like we're having dueling baptisms. Like, are you guys in competition? Because he's getting a bunch down there, John. You know. So John answers and tries to clear it up for us here. John answers verse 27. It said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, he's already told them that, so he's reminded them, right? Remember that I said, I am not the Christ, John the Baptist said. But I'm sent before him, in front of him, to prepare the way of the Lord, he told him. And then John uses a, a preacher illustration about a wedding. He that has the bride, that would be the bridegroom, that'd be the groom, wouldn't it? But the friend of the groom, which stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So John is saying, to, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is the, is the groom. The church is his bride. John says, I'm, just the, I'm happy to be the friend of the bridegroom. We're not in competition here. He's the one that's verse 30, big words. John, John, as a humble preacher, got it right. He said, he's the one that's got to increase. I've got to decrease. I'm going away. He's going to get larger and larger here. 
Every preacher, that ought to be every preacher's verse. I got, Lord, I, I've got to decrease and you've got to increase. Old preachers used to pray, Lord, hide me in the shadow of the cross. Right? Let, let Jesus be the one that shall. He must increase, but I must decrease, John the Baptist said. 31. He that comes from above, Jesus came from heaven, right? <clears throat> He's above all. He's above all. That's Jesus says Lord again, right? And he that is of the earth, that'd be John the Baptist, and speaks of the earth. But he that comes from heaven, that's the Lord. He's above all. Way above me, John says. Remember, John said, I'm not worthy to untie sandals. And, and what he has seen and heard, and that he testifies, and no man receiveth his testimony. What he's seen and heard, that he testifies. And no man, John's kind of flabbergasted that everybody ain't following him. <laughs> He that's received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Or anybody that received the gospel that Jesus was preaching already in the kingdom of God has set to his seal. <clears throat> I looked over in the middle of my little translation today like this. Uh, here's a word that we use a lot, especially us that volunteer for the forest service. Set to his seal means he's certified. <laughs> a lot of jobs today, you can't do nothing unless you're certified to do that first, right? And, and here's a way of looking at it. So John the Baptist says, whoever receives the testimony of Christ is certified. How <laughs> do you finish it? That God's true. <laughs> For Verse 34. For he whom God hath sent... Speaks the words of God. Now, originally it's talking about Jesus, right? But I, I believe that if, if they've God sent preachers, they're going to preach the word of God too, even today. For God gives not the Spirit by measure unto him, being Christ. I think it's over in Paul's epistle said that, that all every other man, God gives a measure of the Spirit. But in Christ, the fullness of the Spirit dwelt. God didn't give it a measure to him. He said the full measure. Verse 35, the Father loves the Son... What's the difference between the Father and the Son? The Father is God. When we think of the Son, that's the human Jesus indwelled by God. It helps us make that distinction. No less God than God the Father or God the Spirit. Trinity. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He that Last verse, 36. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. Now, there, we could take that back to Nicodemus who's asking questions about being born again. Here it is, Nicodemus. You believe in Jesus and you've got everlasting life. <laughs> You're born again, born from above. He that believes on the Son has everlasting life. Flip that coin over in the light and the darkness side. Here we're going to the darkness side. And, and he that believes not the Son, who living in unbelief of Jesus, he'll not see life. In this world or the other one, he's a dead man walking. But the wrath of God abides on him already. He's a condemned already. The good news is, if you're still walking around with physical life, you can get spiritual life by believing in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gospel tonight as found in John 3 here. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen.